Chapter 5 Missing Dr. Crandall What happens after death? Are all of our sins tallied? Anna asked nervously. Every last one, he said. He smiled at Anna. Pawnee told me that you discovered the fire, Anna. You s just had to stick your fucking nose where it didn't belong, didn't you? If the clinic had burned down, I could have gotten a huge insurance check. Acorn is frightening me more and more each day, said Anna. He has secrets locked inside his mind that no mortal should know, and I have a feeling that he will soon unleash them. Then you're both abominations before the laws of man and God, Pam whispered to herself. Anna looked around the office again. Was the cat hiding knowledge even more sinister and frightening than acorns? She still didn't see him. Where's the black cat th that has been terrifying us since this fateful morning, she said. Dr. Crandall looked around the office, too. Isn't he here? he said. The panic rising in his voice. Pawnee came into the office. Her blood ran cold when she saw that Anna was alive once more, but not literally cold in the sense of reptiles' blood. She could still thermoregulate with the best of them. Where's the black cat? asked Anna. Dr. Crandall got him out of the fire, Pawnee said, casting an uncertain glance at Pam. Pam mouthed, later. Then what happened? asked Anna. Pawnee thought for a second. Brandy started to admit to his many horrible crimes and murders, she said. I put the cat down and gagged Brandy. The time for confession is later. Trust me, I know what I'm doing. When I looked back, the cat was gone. Anna felt the shiv that she kept in her pocket. Do you think the cat ran back into the fire? She asked Dr. Crandall. Like horses do? Dr. Crandall shook his head. No, he answered. No animal but a pony would be idiotic enough to do that. God damn her pony, stupid. Good lord. Fucking ponies. Pawnee pulled Pam aside as Anna and the doctor tended to the pets. What the Christ-loving fuck happened to Anna? She whispered. I don't know, Pam said. She seems unchanged so far, but who knows what she brought back from the other side with her. One more thing, hissed Pawnee, about what you said earlier in the paddock. Pam licked her lips. Ah, oh, so you are curious about the identity of your real father. Even in these dark times, Pam could not miss a chance to play mind games with the Indianian city that she called her friend. My father is Ron fucking Swanson, Pawnee said, and if you even try to suggest otherwise to me, I will dismantle you. Understand? Pam just smirked. She knew that the seed of doubt had been planted in Pawnee's mind, and it was soon to become a sprout of doubt, then a tree of doubt, for a seed, be it a metaphorical or a literal one, has power. And what tremendous power it is, Acorn, said the cat in his adumbral, soul-melting tones. But I command power too, the power of death. And I used that power to pluck Anna's life from this earth like a speck of dandruff from a slovenly head. She died of a heart attack twenty minutes ago, Acorn. The horse said nothing. But as I told you, you have power. In this case, ironically, it is the power of life. I will bring her back, but only if you make a deal with me. What sort of deal? Acorn asked hoarsely. Please take a moment to appreciate my pun. I put hours of work into it. You must simply agree to take a walk with me. That's all. Where will you lead me? Minos chuckled. Ah, now that's the question, isn't it? You'll just have to wait to find out, although I'm sure you already know. When? When I call you. Acorn ruminated. Seeds symbolize life, yes, but they're also inextricably wound together with death, Acorn, the cat said, beating the seed metaphor to within an inch of its metaphorical life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. John 5.24? <laughs> Very clever. But neither the word nor the word can save you now. You know it's 12.24. You also know that it's the epigram of Bratya Karamazovi. Yes, acorn, your life is more Karamazovian, and more Dostoevskian for that matter, than the lives of most. I would assume yours is as well. Tell me, cat, which better describes your own life? Pretzaplinia i Zakania, or Biesa? I'm sure you'd like to know, but let's just say that my Zapiski are both Iz Potpolia and Iz Miotvovo Doma. Acorn was silent for a brief moment. The galaxies of synapses and neurotransmitters that crackled in his gothic cathedral of a brain churned and stewed in deepest contemplation. 
All right, he said at last. I've known that this day was coming, and I've put it off long enough. I'll follow you, Minos. Don't pretend you're doing this for you or for me, the cat said. You're doing it for her. Acorn said nothing. You're not even going to deny it. Maybe you have changed after all, but too a little too late. I look forward to our walk. Goodbye, Acorn. Minos took a tiny pebble of a shit and slinked off into the black night. Ten minutes in the past, a dead girl's heart restarted and she sat up in the snow. Acorn knew better than most that nothing comes without a cost. Anna experimentally flexed the new robotic arm the Pam had whipped up for her. How fortuitous that my friend is a world-class cybernetics expert, she thought to herself. After the Pony Pals cleared their web browser's histories and, and co cookies, they went back outside with, with the intention of finding and killing that damn cat. It was safe for the horses and ponies to go back in the barn. The girls led the ponies inside, and licked off the snow, dried them off, and discussed their plans for dismantling the patriarchy. The whole time Anna was helping with the ponies, she kept sharpening her dagger for the cat. She didn't see him anywhere. Nor did she see Acorn. But she didn't worry. She was used to Acorn vanishing for weeks at a time, and then suddenly returning, covered in assorted viscera and miscellaneous cruor. Cruor is a good word, she thought to herself, as she absentmindedly crushed a rock into fine sand with her robot hand. We have to sleep in my room, Pam told Pawnee her and Anna, with a not-at-all subtle wink at the two of them. We can share my bed. Anna didn't care Very much for Pam's sexual advances, no matter how attractive Pam might be in the moonlight. Her hair still flecked with ash, her eyes bright and sparkling, her lips half-parted, her dark skin looking so soft and strangely inviting, but no, not tonight at least. Tomorrow she could search for the cat and explore the complexities of her developing adolescent sexuality. Anna was the first pony pal to wake up the next morning. She had had terrible dreams, if they could even be called dreams. Ever since she had died, everything was different. It felt as if rather than returning to life from the other side, she had traveled straight through and come out of the other end, returning full circle to her starting place, the other side of the other side. No one could possibly understand what it was like to awaken from that slumber that should have been eternal. Is this mockery of life, this half-existence, really better than death? Anna whispered to herself as she gazed out the window at the falling snow, swirling a snifter of brandy with her robot hand, the other hand pressed longingly against the window pane. Shape without form, shade without color, paralyzed force, gesture without motion. She took a sip of her liquor. But not even spirits could give her the temporary relief of oblivion that they were once able to offer. Perhaps because I have no spirit of my own, she thought. Anna swirled the brandy some more and observed the liquids widen and gyre. She drained the glass and threw it against the wall, watching as it fell apart. The center could not hold. Anna had no innocence to be drowned, and she was certainly full of passionate intensity. She welcomed the mere anarchy and bathed in the blood-dimmed tide. She would deafen that fucking falcon herself if it came to that. Perhaps the long-awaited rough beast was neither Acorn nor Minos, but Anna herself. But towards what destination was Anna slouching? She dressed quietly and went out to the new barn. She was going to find that fucking cat. Someone would die today. Anna looked for the cat in the straw and on the rafters of Acorn's stall. The little fucker wasn't there. Acorn nuzzled Anna's shoulder sleepily. I'm going to exterminate from this world every trace of that goddamn cat, she told him. But Acorn wouldn't meet her eye. Anna was accustomed to Acorn's pensive moods, especially after he returned from one of his mysterious disappearances. She never begrudge him the time it takes to clear one's brain of a new darkness, or to wait for the new darkness to spread until the whole brain is uniformly tainted and therefore uniformly purified. But this felt different. Was this the cat's doing, she asked herself? Or has Acorn finally gnawed through the last thread that connected him to sanity, as I always knew that he eventually would? Anna looked in the rest of the horse stalls. No cat. Catechism could assuage the fear that coursed through her, as religion is helpless in the face of that which is inherently and insistently not only godless and ungodly, but even god-negating. No cat. Catharsis was to be had today, Anna knew. Catharsi, she said, then shook her head sadly. Her soul would remain unpurged. No cat. Catatonia was not the answer either. It was far too late to hide or feign unresponsiveness. Pam and Pawnee came into the old barn. Did you find the cat? Categorical imperative that I explained to you last night to be helpful in your struggle to understand morality? Pawnee asked. No, said Anna. I believe that we live in a post-Kantian world. Also, the cat's still fucking missing. Maybe he went into the woods, said Pawnee, while drinking peppermint schnapp straight from the bottle. She had a serious problem. 
It's so cold out there, said Anna. I would say I hope he freezes, but I know that the liquid brimstone that surely flows through his veins will keep him warm. Pam put a mink stole around Anna's shoulders. We'll all look for the cat, she creaked. But first we have to feed our ponies. Okay, said Anna. Pam went to the barn to get her pair of balances. When she returned, she leapt on Acorn's back, and lo, Anna beheld the black horse and its rider. Come and see, Pawnee told Anna. A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. What the ever-loving fuck are you saying? asked Anna. Acorn ran around the paddock once, and then stopped. Anna was surprised that Acorn didn't run with his friends. But the red, white, and pale horses and their riders were nowhere to be found. Acorn just stood at the fence and stared into the woods. He's looking for the cat, thought Anna. Even the company of a devil must be preferable to being alone. After they ate breakfast, the girls packed thermoses. You know what? <clears throat> the liquor joke is too obvious here. This time I'm going to make the thermoses full of healthy soup. You gotta give your characters a break once in a while. You're responsible for them, after all, and not in some shitty, pseudo-clever, magniloquent, metafictional way. Don't worry, I'm not going to get all six characters in search of E here. That would just be self-indulgent. I mean, I'm obviously going to inevitably write myself into the story later, and it's going to be incredibly fucking self-indulgent. I'm going to be handing out indulgences like a 16th century Catholic clergyman, except I'll be handing them all to myself. Indulging myself all over the damn place. Martin Luther is going to have to come over here himself and bust my popish ass for it. I guess what I'm saying, Jane, is that I'm directly responsible for the Protestant Reformation. I conceived this book as a dumb gag birthday present for you, but it somehow turned into a Faustian, perilously close to Fustian, saga about good and evil. At least that's what I think it's become about. I honestly still don't know at this point. Ergo, aforementioned responsibility. I always get carried away with my projects, you know that. But here's the rub. When I started inserting all that grandiloquent prose, it was ironic and intentionally turgid and purple as shit. But I'm really not sure if that's still what I'm doing, or if I'm sincerely trying to write a compelling, dare I say meaningful, story about the nature of sin and redemption. It's certainly a possibility. Perhaps this whole project is some Freudian mechanism I'm using to work through the complex issues tucked away deep in the neglected, cobwebby corners of my troubled teenage psyche. Or a Jungian mechanism. Or a Genetian one. Jasperian? Christ, what is with European psychotherapists and J-names? It's like psychology is Willy Wonka's chocolate factory, and I'm Charlie fucking Bucket out here, looking through the gate, my little sooty popper nose poking through the bars, wondering what could possibly be inside. Oh, what saccharine fantasies! Oh, what levulose reveries! Oh, the vagaries of gumdrops and licorices and taffies! But no Tootsie Rolls, because fuck those disgusting things, am I right? But then I find one of the five golden copies of the interpretation of dreams, and I get to accidentally explore this mysterious Wonka Wunderpalace where events unfold as predictably and phallocentrically as would be expected from such an adventure through the psyche of an aging candy tycoon who's the type of guy that invites nubile youths to his factory to inspect his fantastic contraptions. Okay, fuck. I got way off track there. My attempt to assure you that I wasn't going to succumb to the allure of faux philosophical meta-commentary turned into just that, and uh, then it turned into a lengthy fantasy about Willy Wonka, I guess? Needless to say, the whole digression was slash is ironic. But it's the type of irony that has actually become sincere by virtue of its utterly failed approximation of sincerity. You know I never unironically write something like those first few paragraphs, and I know you know. So the fact that I did is a de facto breach of an unstated contract of communicational transparency between us. That I would betray said contract then becomes the actual meaning of the gesture. Why would I do such a thing if not to emphasize the degree of my sincerity? The form of the message becomes its content, and the original content and the meaning thereof is jettisoned off to God knows where. Eventually, we both become so concerned about whether or to what degree I'm being ironic that we lose track of what it is that I'm being or not being ironic about. And of course, in the above paragraph, as well as this one, the pretense of shedding my irony to address you directly about my failed use of irony elsewhere is another level of overarching irony, further masking slash enhancing the sincerity of said address as well as the original content, if it's even accessible anymore. Sincerity has become just another pharmacon, the supposed cure to my irony, yet one which effaces the original message just as much as the poisonous irony that obscured it in the first place. Either way, meaning is lost. It's complicated, is what I'm saying. Layers. Pharmacon. I'll explain it to you someday. After eating their healthy soup, 
The two girls in the town set out on their journey to find the motherfucking cat so they could kill it and get back to their regular pony pal shit. As they rode, Pam looted a sweatshirt from a nearby corpse. Anna didn't ask Pam how she knew the corpse was there. This sweatshirt will make a perfect smothering tool for the cat, she said. When they went back outside, Acorn was still standing at the fence, looking into the woods. The pony pals thought he was idly contemplating the terrifying vacuum the one inevitably finds when searching for any sort of meaning in existence, as he was wont to do. Little did they know that today Acorn was brooding on a more personal terror. Minos would be coming for him, and Acorn had a feeling that the moment of his arrival would be very soon indeed. And then that infernal cat would lead Acorn somewhere. He would use no halter or reins, but Acorn knew that this was the one rider that he could not buck. We have important work to do today, Anna told Acorn. We're going to look for that unholy cat. And then we are going to embrace our basest and most primal bloodlust and rend its head from its body. Anna put her left foot in the stirrup and swung up in the saddle. For what Acorn knew would probably be the last time. Acorn was not one for sentimentality. Emotions, he had found, started to fade from one's mind after the first few thousand years of living. But Minos' words the other day had reawakened something within him. Why did he let Anna put a saddle on him? His previous riders had all been mighty gladiators, inspiring leaders of men, brilliant warrior poets, or chefs of above-average talent. And now, Anna Harley, pony pal. Acorn was no unicorn, attracted to and tamed by the purity of a young woman. Then again, Anna was far from pure. But it was not her bloodthirstiness that had drawn Acorn to her either. Was it really, as Minos had tauntingly suggested, fear of his own power and his increasing inability to properly control it? Acorn had to admit that he was getting old, getting tired. Was he trying to sequester himself, to forget all that he had been and the potential he had? The potential to be what had never before been and what could barely be at all? Was Anna the steel-lined concrete containment building around the nuclear fusion reactor that was his mind? Anna took up Acorn's reins and led him into the woods. Together, they melted into the tree line. All three, the girl, the pony, the woods, were lovely, dark, and deep. But Acorn had a promise to keep, and miles to go, and miles to go. Detective Pony was originally written by Jean Betancourt. The first two pages were altered by Andrew Hussey, pretending to be Dirk Strider. The rest of the pages were altered by Sonnet Stuck, also pretending to be Dirk Strider. The book is read by Duckface as yet another person pretending to be Dirk Strider, and Naked Bee as Jean Betancourt, a fourth character who may or may not be Dirk Strider. This recording was instigated, perpetrated, and assembled by Naked Bee.